is it possible to stamp out corruption from Nigeria? But when did this menace begin to manifest and what have successive government done to curb this menace? In this video, we will answer the above questions as well as examine the history of corruption in Nigeria. We will link all this to why Nigeria is extremely corrupt today. Please stay tuned. Hello, 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 His Plus. Welcome to this episode on His Pool Media. Gabriel here. When the British colonial government came into this path of the war, their main interest was economic exploration and exploitation. They introduced a system of administration known as indirect rule. The essence was to establish an effective administration based on consular system with native councils and minor councils as its agents. As a result, warrant chiefs and clerks as well as court messengers were used. However, corruption began to rear its ugly head in various chiefdoms and kingdoms of this part of the world which later were amalgamated into an entity known today as Nigeria. People were outraged by the arbitrary selection of court warrant heads and clerks and attempted a passive revolt in some instances. These warrant chiefs in the south and emirs in the north tried cases and oversaw forced labor. This made them extremely powerful and corrupt. They were known for selling justice and employing forced labor. Corruption and hardship became so widespread that in 1919, a panel of inquiries submitted a report that revealed that application for warrants was merely for the purpose of self-enrichment and that if this warrant system was to be investigated on the issue of bribery and corruption, about 90% of the warrant chiefs would be imprisoned. Most of the warrant chiefs prospered in material things through bribery and corruption. In the light of the above, Researchers conclude that the Warren Chief system was rotten to the core. Corruption in Nigeria continued to grow from strength to strength. In May 1954, a commission of inquiry was established to investigate the activities of the Igbo Etiti District Council. The commission concluded that the handling of the council's business had become a public disgrace. The committee's report noted a systematic corruption in the award of contracts and promotion of workers ranging from 80 to 100 pounds. From local government level, corruption began to penetrate the entire polity as those who were regarded as the nationalists were also accused. For example, in 1954, a tribunal known as the Foster Sutton Tribunal investigated the operation of the African Continental Bank ACB. The report concluded that Namdi Azikiwe was managing the bank's business like a personal estate and that his conduct failed to meet the standards of honest and reasonable individuals. It is interesting that rather than losing power as a result of the tribunal's indictment, Dr. Namdi Azikiwe was applauded for his victory in the 1957 general elections, a success that inspired the economist to describe Nigerians as having a sunny and tolerant disposition towards corruption. As of 1960, when Nigeria gained independence from Britain, corruption had infiltrated the habits of all politicians. This was evidenced by the series of commissions of inquiry established by Major General Agui Ronsi into the affairs of the Electric Corporation of Nigeria, the Nigerian Airways Authority, Nigeria Railway Corporation, and the Nigerian Port Authority. The reports indicted some noble politicians like Chief Festu Sokotiebo, Njoku, Ribano, and Ekejani, as well as Chief Daffy who was indicted for not knowing the difference between Nigerian Airways and the NCNC party headquarters. Ministers and political office holders were also known for one or more forms of corruption. In defense of his accusation of corruption, Minister of Finance Chief Festus Okotiebo quoted from the Holy Bible when he says, To those that have, more shall be given while the Minister of Aviation, Dr. K. O. Mbadiwe, told the House of Representatives that his wealth came from sources that are known and unknown. Chief Samuel Akintola was nicknamed Rigging. Amadou Bello was famous for his expensive attire, allegedly maintaining the most elaborate wardrobe in the world with ill-gotten cash. 
Dr. Ike Jani, the chairman of the Nigerian Railway Corporation, was not only found guilty of misallocating funds, but the panel also recommended that he never hold public office any longer. He inflicted a contract for the construction of the Railway Medical Center from £75 to £440. Corruption was the main reason given by Major Kaduna Nziogu for staging the first coup d'etat in Nigeria's political history. In fact, before 1966, vocabulary such as rigging, kickback, you scratch my back, I scratch your back, 10 percenters, inducement have become the day-to-day -day language of the political class. By the end of 1955, politicians had established a reputation for corruption, waste, and a lack of genuine concern for the people they ruled and those who had elected them. With the coup d'etat that ushered in General Yakubu Gawan's administration in July 1966, Major General Aguironsi's attempt to fight corruption ended abruptly. Gowon's regime could have been incredibly fortunate and prosperous for Nigeria because it coincided with the oil boom, but he was confused and corrupt as he was claimed to have told the world that Nigeria's problem is not money, but what exactly to do with the money. That confusion and waste of the gains of oil boom was revealed further in the report of the Political Bureau of 1987. According to the report, the opportunities presented by the oil boom for the realization of the developmental aspiration of Nigeria were largely wasted. End revenue was lavished on unviable and grandiose projects. Corruption flourished on a scale almost impossible to imagine. It is therefore my sincere belief that if Gowon had utilized the opportunity presented by the oil boom and pursued an agenda that would rid Nigeria of corruption, the economic and political history of Nigeria would have been on the positive side of world history. His administration was then characterized by despair, moral decadence, hunger and starvation even amid the oil boom. It was on this premise that Colonel Joseph Namvan Garba announced his overthrow on Tuesday, July 29, 1975. This coup ushered in General Moritala Mohammed. From the inception of his administration, Moritala Mohammed promised to be the long awaited messiah that would rid Nigeria of corruption. He swung into action immediately by first forfeiting his own ill-gotten world to the nation before carrying out his war against corruption. As soon as he came into power, discipline returned in all spheres of our national lives. Public servants, police, and military officers were all found on their duty post and on time. Lateness for work immediately vanished. To Nigerians, a serious-minded and incorruptible leader has emerged. In an inquiry launched by Moritala Mohammed, all the military governors of the previous administration and the administrator of East Central State were all found guilty of corruption and dismiss. Only two former governors, Brigadier Mobuladi Johnson of Lagos State and Oluwole Rotimi of the Western State, were found not guilty. The corrupt ones also forfeited their ill-gotten property. For instance, Brigadier Samuel Obumudia's multi-million Palm Royal Motel was seized, while the assets worth over 200,000 belonging to Upabi Asika of East Central States were also seized. Also, property worth over 99,000 was seized from Joseph Gomwork of Benue Plateau State. The former governor of Northwestern State, Alhaji Usman Farouk, also forfeited property worth over 260,000. Unfortunately, his administration was short lived. He was assassinated in a bloody coup attempt on 13 February 1976 by agents of corruption, personified in Lieutenant Colonel Bukar Sukar Dimka of the Nigerian Army Physical Training Corps. This ushered in the administration of General Olushigun Obasanjo. Obasanjo handed over power to a democratically elected government of Haraji Shehu Usman Shagari on October 1, 1979. Even though Shagari was an honest and dedicated gentleman, he was not careful and he lacked the charisma to control his government. It is believed that his party chairman, Chief Adisa Akinloye, was far more powerful than the president himself. 
apart from his vice president Alex Ekwembe and a few others, practically every political office holder around him was corrupt. Likewise, the governors who served with him. This was evidence when his government was overthrown in December 1983 by General Muhammadu Buhari and Idiabun. Part of the coup speech announcing the overthrow of Shehu Shagari by Brigadier Sani Abaja reads, Our leaders revel in squandering, corruption, indiscipline and continue to proliferate public appointment in complete disregard to our stark economic realities. The Buari Diagon regime developed a comprehensive plan to fight corruption and indiscipline. The establishment of war against indiscipline was one of the harsh measures taken to tackle these ills. Many politicians were arrested, tried, and imprisoned during his regime. Financial fraud and mismanagement charges grew from thousands to close to millions. Prominent among those who received the wrath of justice were Colonel Peter Obasi, who was sentenced to 14 years imprisonment for corruption. He was also banned from participating in politics and was to return some money to the government. Mr. Raymond O. Fernandez was jailed for seven years and to forfeit some money. He was also banned from politics for life. Jim Wobodo, who was the governor of Anambra State, was banned from politics for life jailed for 10 years and was to forfeit ill-gotten money to the government. Amos Adenuga was jailed for 5 years and was to forfeit a huge sum of money. He was also banned from participating in politics for life. Others who were jailed and or banned from politics include Mr. Victor Igwe, Mr. Ife Kassam, Chief Daniel Okumagba and Udo Eshet, who was the former speaker of the Cross River State House of Assembly. They also forfeited huge sums of money to the federal government. General Ibrahim Badamosi Babangida, who organized a coup d'etat to overthrow General Buhari in 1985, was probably irritated by these harsh tactics. Even though General Babangida promised a better nation to Nigerians, this promise was rather imagined than felt by the masses. His regime could be described by many as a bad omen to Nigerians. This is because as soon as he consolidated power, he set up to release all the political detainees, make friends with them, and reverse Nigeria's progress in the fight against corruption to square one. Consequently, almost all the Hitato sentenced politicians and those declared wanted and were on the run would soon become men of honor. He surrounded himself with psychophants, and those who dared to criticize him had an ugly experience to tell series of transition timetables were set up by his administration, but none ever materialized beyond the drawing board. The annulment of the June 12 election, an election that was considered the fairest and freest election in our national history and won by Chief MKO Abiola, was an indication that Wabangida had no plans to leave office. However, this move proved to be self-destructive. After so much pressure from both local and international quarters, Babangida designed an exit strategy for himself by handing over power to an interim national government, ING. The ING, which was largely powerless, was headed by Chief Ernest Shunekon, who was deputized by General Sani Abacha as the Chief of Army Staff and Defense Secretary. An arrangement that paved way for General Sani Abacha to overthrow the government on November 17, 1993. Indeed, corruption was a free-for-all under Abacha and he became an epitome of corruption himself. When Abdusalami Abubakar took over in 1998 after Abacha's sudden death, he signed a decree that enabled Nigerians to know the level of Abacha's loot and that of his cronies. Since then, several millions of dollars and even pounds have been recovered. A discussion of corruption under General Abacha's regime is enough to take a full video. Since independence, all leaders in Nigeria have pledged to eliminate corruption and sharp practices, only for several of them later to be accused of theft on a spectacular scale. This was the case with Olushigono Basinjo, who during his second coming between May 1999 and May 2007 was accused of squandering about $200 billion of oil money. This accusation was from no less a person than General Muhammadu Buhari, who was the presidential aspirant of the ANPP at the time. 
and was contained in Saturday Independent publication of 17th February 2007. His vice president was equally accused of diverting 10 billion naira. It should, however, be noted that on the 1st of October 2002, Obasinjo declared that corruption is bad for the nation and should not be condoned in any form. The Obasinjo's administration went on to establish the Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses Commission, the ICPC, and the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, the EFCC. Are these bodies effectively fighting corruption in Nigeria today? Well, I would like to hear your thoughts in comment section. Watch this video here to know how every Nigerian president died and their last words. Remember to smash the like button on this video and leave a comment below. Subscribe to our channel if you have not done so. I will see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching. Peace.